Well, we've got a quote up here today. My idea of education is to unsettle the minds of the young and inflame their intellects. Literally, sometimes, I'd like to set their mind on fire so they can learn to think a little bit about science. This demonstration I have here, I use very near the beginning of the year, probably the second day. The first day they come in and I go through a demonstration with a large bottle that has some fire. We talk about the reaction between ethanol and oxygen to give us carbon dioxide and water. And then we do some other activities the first day. But then I give them an assignment, homework the first day. I firmly believe in giving homework. And that it is to read the book, you know, the book. They own a book. They have it. They read it, in theory, on quantitative, qualitative, interpretation, and observations. What are the differences in those words? What do they mean? And that's what I charge them with to do the first night. And it's probably deadly dull reading. I'm sure it is. But I, I want them to read about it and try to put those words into their mind. So they come back the next day, and we talk a little bit about interpretation, what quantitative mean, what qualitative mean, what, what does an observation mean? And then we go on to other things. And then there's about 10 minutes left in the period. And I bring out, let me just blow this out. I bring out the candle, OK? And I say, all right, so here I've got, uh, here I've got a candle. And what I'd like you to do on your paper there, I'd like you to put a line down the center. And then on uh, one half, I'd like you to write the words quantitative, on the other half, qualitative. And I'm going to light this candle. And all you have to do is take as many rats. i got to back up here. All you have to do is write as many of these observations as you can in the next eight minutes. All right, and some of them are going, I thought this was going to be an exciting class. He's, this guy wants me to watch a candle burn for eight minutes and write stuff? That's bogus. And then I say, and I'm going to call on some of you to read those. And they go, oh, I better actually do it because, you know, it's the first day or the second day. So let me light this. We light it. And we let it burn. And they're supposed to take some observations. So. You know, you've timed it, so there's about 10 minutes. Give them about five minutes. It's not going to take that long. Trust me, they're not going to get that many. If you read the old chem study book, they collect something like 58 qualitative and quantitative demonstration, uh, observations on this experiment. But they'll be lucky to get two or three. Start calling on them. Start from the back. And work forward and see what you get. You know, you'll get a lot of qualitative ones, but not in any quantitative ones. OK. Um, now, the bizarre thing is some of them will see the carbon dioxide coming off in the water vapor, because you've done something like that yesterday. You talked about it and how it, it does come off. Some of them will see the wax dripping and other phenomenon going on, you know, even in the back row. And they'll, they might tell you the size if you're lucky and the color. Those are pretty common ones. But after that, they might think it's hot. And I go, Did you really, really, is it hot? Did you experience that firsthand, so to speak? Of course, they didn't. Uh, they say, well, from my experience, I, say, I know, I know, but you really probably didn't feel it from your position. So now you've timed it. There's about one minute left. You've had them read their observations. The bell's about to ring, if you have bells. We, we didn't have bells. We had buzzers, so I guess we kind of got the Nobel Prize. And um, There's about one minute left. And you know, the big thing in science, the big thing in science is change. With new experiments and new interpretations, we sometimes have to change the data that we have. So you pick up your candle, and you eat it. And you walk out of the room. Mm -hmm. The bell rings, they leave, and they go, that man's insane. <laughs> That's, you ate that candle. You ate it. So they go home and they tell their parents, my science teacher ate the candle. And it, was, it, was a little, you know, it drives them crazy. Now, if you want, um, well, I'll tell you in a minute. This is a nice example of a uh, discrepant event. Because the next day, they'll come back in. And they'll want to know what was in the candle. How did that work? That wasn't a real candle. I go, well, how do you know? 
They said, it crunched. And I said, you've ever eaten candles? They crunch, try it. Some will go home and try it. Come on, try it and crunch. <laughs> no, I want to know what it is. Never tell them. This drives them insane. There are certain things, they don't want to know a lot of stuff in science, but this they do want to know. I've had parents come in on parents night and demand to know what the candle was. Kids come back after they graduated. It's better than that, but in a minute I'll tell you that. So this is a discrepant event. By that I mean, let me just make sure I get this right. An event that has a counterintuitive or, or unexpected thing happen that runs contrary to one's first line of reasoning or current set of values. And that's a good thing to do to kids. Use um, discrepant events because it makes them think differently about what's going on. They have a lot of preconceived notions and this can shake them up a bit. There's all kinds of discrepant events in science. Uh, this demonstration does create interest. See your interest. You want to know what the heck is going on. Okay? It creates excitement. It gives a reason for knowing what the heck is happening. Now let me read an actual quote from an educational journal to show that I'm just not making this stuff up. This is from the Journal of Chemical Education. The student is involved in cognitive conflict. Now there's a set of words for you. Cognitive conflict in the brain. These events act as a switch to turn the brain on. Okay? It does. It makes you think differently about it. You know, if, if I took a paper clip and I threw it up to the ceiling and it stuck, you'd go, whoa, Wilbur, I thought everything that went up came down. This could drive you crazy. Now, the, I used to do that because I'd put a big honking magnet in the ceiling tiles in the other side. And I'd throw it up and it would stick. And then they'd go, what the heck? Then I'd take the magnet down overnight because, you know, someone would sneak in the room while you're out in the hall and look and they'd go up and they'd, no, there's nothing up there. And, They'd say, do it again. No, we've done it once. I'm sorry. That's, that's the end of that one. So here's another quote on that from George Bodner on discrepant events. George Bodner is the guru of chemical education, so I know I'm doing things right. And all age groups show a marked preference for objects or situations that are novel, that have an element of surprise or incongruity, that generate uncertainty. So in this case, you realize now it's a scam. What I did was I took a potato and I cord it with this. This you probably own. It's a cork borer, okay? And you bore out a slug of potato, and then you coat it with lemon so it doesn't oxidize. But even if it gets brown, what do they know about candles, okay? It just tastes better with a little bit of lemon. Then you want a wick. So what you do is you get a Brazil nut and cut it. These will burn for up to five minutes, a Brazil nut. They burn very nicely, okay? Now, some people don't like to eat potatoes, so they can, you can use a banana, but that's going to oxidize. That's going to get a coating on it. It's pretty bad, even faster. Okay. Um, do it towards the end of the period so that you can, you know, get rid of it, um, and they can walk out of the room and, and think about it at the time. Now, um, let me read you a an email from a student that I got. This one is important. This demonstration stayed with this kid. Dear Mr. Merrick, this is just one of your former students writing to say hi. I happened to be up in Illinois last week and saw a part that I think you may have been on the very last Bozo show, and they played a clip of you making Bozo get sprayed out of a get sprayed with something out of a pumpkin. Very cool. Anyway, I'm living in North Carolina, married with two children. I'm a professor at Duke University, and my area is developmental psychology. My research is how babies perceive and uh, represent objects. I just wanted to say hi and thank you once again for all the support and encouragement you gave me over the years. It is great because teachers like you, I found that science can be engaging and fun. I'm sure that you are, I'm one of many who have, you have, uh, have been inspired by you in science careers, but the great things you have done. Now it turns out she based her PhD thesis on this demo. How do you perceive what is real, what isn't real? How do babies perceive? This thing got her thinking about all kinds of things. And she told me later on that I based it, remember that candle thing you had? Because she became my lab aide later on and I explained it to her. She says, you know, I was fooled by that. I thought it was a real candle. And uh, there's something else too in this email. What a great thing you've done. Okay, I can't, I still can't say or hear phrases like, how unfortunate, like when they would come up and complain about their grade or lab data, or the less common, wrong o moose breath -o. Um, I'd love to hear what you're up to and what you've been thinking about. Best wishes, Amy Work Needham, class of 1983, professor at Duke. 
you never know what you're going to say in class or what demo you're going to do or what you're going to do and what kind of influence that is going to have on students. And that's the neatest thing about the internet in my estimation is hearing from former students and what they've done.